So welcome to this week's episode of Chuck Chat. And I've been bringing different people on so they can tell their stories. And today I bring my good friend Les Goldberg from Hello. LMG. LMG stands for what? Les Mark Goldberg. Ba -da -da. And, and Les, you know, it's funny is uh, some of the guys I've talked to mm -hmm. have very similar beginnings. Like I was a lawnmower boy. John so, Morgan was a lawnmower boy. I, I was a lawnmower boy too. How old were you when you started cutting grass? Fourteen. Okay, you, you were, I was twelve. So we were both little kids. And, yes. and why did you cut grass? Because it was about being productive and making money. And at fourteen, that's a way to make money that you, you know, no one's going to hassle you about. And, and don't you feel that the entrepreneur spirit? It starts at a young stage in life, and it's a mentality of how can I create. What, what can I do? And it is, it's about being productive. And you, so you started lawn mowing and what do you do after that? Uh, from lawn mowing to, there was a stint at the flea market in, in Maitland, which the little red barn flea market. And then it was into live event production and video production. So I remember you told me at the flea market, you sold magazines and different things. You'd resell magazines. Uh, I would sell any piece of junk. We had the, we had a technique that was great. We'd have people that would show up at 6 a.m and they'd get a table, and the tables were like 5 or $10, and we would go with nothing to the flea market, me and a friend of mine who was, I think he was 16 and I was 15, and we would buy this stuff because they basically just wanted to sell it and get out of, they wanted to leave. So we'd buy all of the products between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. By 8.30, we had a full table full of stuff. And you could resell And we would sell everything, and by 1 o'clock, whatever we had left, we'd sell to the other dealers, we were out. It was an easy hundred for a Saturday for a 15 year old. But as a, as a small kid, you're figuring out how to already buy at a discount, buy low, sell high. That is exactly what is one of the magic pieces of the formula. And we also have a similarity that, uh, gosh, when I was 16 years old, I started DJing. And I had a mobile DJ service. Mm -hmm. And a guy by the name of Dewey Bond is the one who got started with me. He, I, I was DJing at the skating rink, and, and Dewey heard me, and he said, uh, do you want to do mobile DJ service? And I said, sure. And he gave me a van, and they book shows, and I'd go DJ him, and we'd split the profits. And I think, didn't you know Dewey Bond? Dewey somehow? Bond and I did the very opening of the um, Orlando Magic, the arena, not the, not the Amway Center, but the arena. We did the opening show with Bill Cosby and with Kenny Rogers and a few others, and we did the video, and Dewey did the audio. So See, the world is a small place. How long ago was that? No, oh, I don't know how many years. Uh, the Magic started playing in 89, so it would be somewhere around 89. And yeah, to digress one second, when you say the world's a small place, I talk about that a lot because we are in a small world. The business mm -hmm. people in our community all know each other. And you know, we've talked about how you don't burn bridges, how you never know when you're gonna come back in contact with somebody, and how important it is to have a good reputation, good integrity, good quality of work, because that's how you get your next job, is by doing a good job. And, and yours is even more demanding what you do today. Like if you screw up a concert, it's a big deal, because there could be 20,000 people seeing your screw up. We are in the business of doing live events, mission critical, music, concerts, uh, and everything is like transporting a live heart. You have to get it right, you have one chance, and you either perform or you don't, and the audience is watching. And there are big audiences, and sometimes there's broadcast audiences, and so. So how did you start? Go back a little bit. How did you get into this business that you're in today? And tell a little bit about what is LMG. You have several locations, and, and sure. you started off small. And just tell about your company a little bit. So uh, out of high school, um, some people are like playing a sport. I wanted to do video production. So uh, at a ripe age of uh, 14 or 15, I started the video club at Lake Brantley High School not a competitor of your alma mater, Winter Park High School. And um, we started a video club, then that turned into uh, wanting to work in the business and uh, a neighbor who lived in the same neighborhood 
Jennifer Estates in uh, Longwood, uh, a guy named Les uh, called up and asked for a gopher, and he called the school, and guess who? They said, oh, we know just the right person, and they sent me down, so he was Big Les, and I was a little scrawny little Les. Was that your first show you did? That was my first uh, production that was, yeah, that was broadcast, for sure. It was Miss National Teenager pageant, and it was Lehigh Valley of Florida, near Naples. And how old were you? I was 14. Wow, what a thing to do at 14, to do a teenage pageant. <laughs> it was, uh, the girls were very interesting. And, and so, what got you kind of into the next level where you had your first employee? Well, from Les's business, ultimately went out of business, and his company was called Freedom Television, and I was graduating high school, and I was contemplating college, and what I had to decide is, you know, to whether I would go to college and start a business. So I ultimately started yeah. a business by buying a projector. And that projector was, while I was going to college, I'd rent this projector out. But if I recall right, I don't have a college degree, and I don't think you did. I have a two-year college degree. It took five years to get a two-year degree, <laughs> and I'm damn proud of it. Well, good. I, I never did that five years. I business the whole time. Yeah, but because we both have airplanes, it must have worked out. <laughs> uh, it, it did. It's a lot of hard work. And uh, like my attorney always says, I went to uh, the School of Hard Knocks. OJT, on the job training. And yeah, I got a lot of uh, street education. And, and like you did, I'm sure you did shows, you started building a business and, and hired hundreds and hundreds of employees since then. But you started off doing a small and see, this is why when you do interviews, you make sure you have your phone on silent, which I should have my phone on silent. Oh, so man. let me change that to silent. Yeah, it's and, all good. And, uh, but that's, it's all good. That's what happens when you're taping something. That's what you want not to happen in a show. Note to self. Silence everything. And um, so I remember I went with you. You got the Super Bowl and you got Madonna. You were doing the halftime show. Yes. And I remember you were all stressed out because there was millions and millions of people viewing 100,000 people in the stands, and it had to go perfect. You know, what we do every day is mission critical, and if uh, the, the expectations of all the pre-planning and the production have to go literally like a fine-tuned oiled machine, kind of like a race team changes the tires, because it's all about execution, and there's risk and reward. And the higher profile of the events, the more risk there is. And you add a, a broadcast audience like on the Super Bowl, or you add whether it's streamed to thousands of people, or you add corporate CEOs, they have a very low tolerance for failure. And your job is to make people look good. Our job is to deliver the message. And we do it with lights, we do it with sound, we do it with LED screens, we do it with visual elements, uh, content, graphics, and we put it all together. And whether it's coming out of a broadcast studio, a corporate event which is being broadcast, or a corporate event in front of thousands of people, you get one chance to get it right, and it's everything. And uh, you know, you, you kind of want to put your heart and soul into it, and that's that's what defines success. If, if you look back, what is the coolest show you've done? Whether a concert or event, or the coolest thing you go, that was cool. Uh, well, I, I won't say that the Super Bowl wasn't cool. It was super cool. And, and we work on different activities around most of the Super Bowls. Um, but I think uh, any type you do an event where you create spectacle. So it's more than just a, an event. It's an experience for the audience. And the higher the profile, whether it, it involves uh, a political campaign or it involves the CEO of Microsoft or Cisco or IBM or all these companies, they have huge expectations and the technological advancements that they deliver, you're, you're standing beside them. So the expectations are really high and you've got to dot your I's and cross your T's and there's just no room for failure. And it's one of those businesses, if everything goes well, you hear, thank you but you generally don't hear from the CEO unless things go wrong. So you didn't ever want that phone call, like what the heck happened? You gotta make sure every light turns on, every camera turns on, all the sure. audio works, everything is, it's, it's hard to be perfect 100% of the time. You know, at the end of the day, this is how we define fun. This is that, like you driving a race car, the exhilaration, we get exhilaration by standing in front of an audience of thousands of people and we, turn, you, know, the, you know how you get a reaction. The easiest reaction for doing a concert or an event is to turn the lights off. And then the audience starts to scream. And that is the beginning of creating spectacle. Yeah, it sounds like fun. So what advice would you give to somebody 
starting a business. Like, yeah, I remember starting my business. It was so small, me and then me and a couple people and learning accounting and legal and all the different things you gotta learn for businesses, billing systems and uh, finance and what, like two or three, four pieces of advice would you tell people are the most important things to build a successful company? First and foremost is absolutely determine what you love to do. Passion. Your passion, you have to find something that you're really good at that you love to do. It's not that you love to do it, but you're not good at it. You have to, you actually have to be good at it, right? And, and you, once you can discover that passion, then all of a sudden that becomes some rocket fuel for you to kind of uh, launch you into a career or down a pathway. But also, you kind of have to have a plan. You know, if, if, if I could tell you how many people told me about great ideas, but would refuse to write them down and create a plan, that, that list would be a very long list. Yeah, it's hard to execute if you don't know what you're gonna execute on. And, and then you have to kind of maybe formulate the idea of you're gonna need some capital for your business. And if you have a, a plan and some capital, and whether it's your capital or you have other people that invest in you, um, follow through on whatever your commitments are, and you need to be able to sell the idea. So uh, it would be like your first big building you built. You may not have, have done one before, but you sure knew you were gonna be able to and you were gonna follow a plan and you knew you could. So the idea with any business is, um, you, you, as long as you can convince others to buy what you're selling and that you're gonna do a good job and then you execute, that is the beginning of something good. And you mentioned capital. Did you have capital when you started your business or how did you get your capital to start? My grandfather loaned me $5,000, Grandpa Sam. And uh, it was a 10% interest rate too. So <laughs> I, learned, I learned about so. interest and family members and interest. The, but the point was someone has to believe in you to give you the opportunity to give you that seed capital. So $5,000 turned into a multi-million dollar business. How long did it take you to pay him back? Three years, <laughs> three years, and uh, you know, but but the idea is that you know, anytime you're starting a business, you're not really reaping the rewards. You're 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 reinvesting and you're putting it all back in, but ultimately, as you you know, first you build a house, then you build a shopping center, then you build a tall tower, right? And in our business, first you start with a, a small show, and then a bigger show, and then the biggest shows. And as you take the biggest shows on, you realize that- it Takes you, a lot more money. It takes more capital, more people, and talent. So ultimately, it's you have to surround yourself with some subset of people that either care as much as you do, uh, or have the same kind of passion, and, and ultimately, it'll allow you to do amazing things. Yeah, you have to surround yourself with great people. It's, uh, the funny thing is, um, like you mentioned, I built smaller buildings and bigger, and our, our business is super capital intensive. And picture like a fire hose with millions of gallons of water running through it. There's a little bit that drips at the connection. We get to keep what drips at the connection because uh. our, every time money comes in, it goes back out to grow because you grow from here to here to here to here. And you've done the same thing. You you had a smaller warehouse and a bigger one and a bigger one and a Las Vegas location. You opened all these locations. So your revenue keeps going back out to work. And, and it never really comes home to harvest because it has to go back out. And so you're always redeploying capital and investing in people and investing in equipment. And it, it's, um, I don't think people always understand that, that, you know, it's like us, even if we sell, you know, a, a shopping center for 150 million bucks, it's not like Chuck got 150 million bucks. It's like, you know, it's a flyover. It doesn't even land here. It just flies over to the next project. And, and you keep building and building. And that's, that's really what successful investment is about. Well, if you, you reinvest strategically, and I know you do, I've seen it, participated in it. And at the end of the day, the fruits of your labor, uh, you, you know, in our business, you go and you see an audience and you, you watch the experience and, and in your business, it's you, you, all you do is drive up to some big thing that you build. And you know, there's a lot of pride, you know, whether you build something or if you put together a team that delivered an amazing show. And uh, you know, the, the touring business is a little more sexy where people can really equate to it because they went and they had that musical experience. Uh, you know, sometimes on an installation on a real sophisticated facility or campus that we're working on, those are super cool. Um, but you know, the largest segment, which is corporate meetings, 
you know, when you get thousands of people together, there's a certain energy that comes together. And whether it's a reveal or recognition of your team or a product launch or, you know, or it's just uh, an update, the, I guess the, um, there's, there's such a good vibe when you get that group together. And I think live events is uh, an interesting business. It's not for the faint at heart. <laughs> Yeah. Now, do you want to keep growing your business and you know adding more locations, or are you happy with the number of locations? Because when you add other locations, it becomes more to manage, and you're managing kind of third-party people away from you. It's harder to do that because you're not right there with them every day. And it, it, how, how much bigger do you want to get? You, you know, it, it's uh, it's not always about how much more revenue you take, and it's about how much. Profit, right? <laughs> right? People and confuse revenue and profit, profit sometimes. Oh, for sure. Uh, I think I think it's a strategy, and it's based on market conditions. And I will say the most interesting thing we've done in the last year is we bought a company in London. So now we have a team there, and uh, it's interesting. We're dealing with a different currency. We're dealing with different time zones, and you know, across the pond. And we have a studio in London, and uh, it's just an interesting thing. So we've gone from a domestic company to an international company, and uh, that's just another little subset of challenges. But now, can you efficiently manage a London office, and do you have someone there who can? efficiently run that office and make it profitable. Yeah, absolutely. We have a team there of great people and uh, you know, and they're, uh, they're doing their thing. But uh, I think the answer to your question is each business segment has an opportunity to grow, whether it's touring or if it's live events or it's doing systems innovation or what we call installations. And uh, you, know, you have to pursue opportunities. And I think we're going to continue to do that and try and have fun in this crazy world we're living in. So do any of your kids want to get involved in your business? They have not shown the same level of passion that I have, and I think it's a it's almost a requirement for what we do. Uh, so I, you know, I I want them to pursue their dreams, and uh, whatever those dreams are. Well, that's the case. Uh, I have a daughter as well, and they have their own passions and their own things they want to do, and it's not necessarily what we want to do, and what we want them to do. They, we want them to be happy and do what they want to do, but just because we do what we do doesn't mean they're going to love doing it. I think. Uh, it's the magic or the secret for our kids is to ultimately find something they are super excited and they're passionate about and that brings them happiness. And I think if anyone was out there that needed advice would be make sure you get your kids engaged in something that they find super interesting and they're excited about. And so, uh, you know, uh, uh, my daughter is actually interning in our office right now. So she's, Lindsay? she's interning in our office to doing uh, marketing and broadcast videos and graphics and just getting an introduction. Is she having fun? She is having a lot of fun and she's got two more years at FSU to, you know, choose a path. And, and But at the end of the day, anyone should, you know, the, the, the most thing they should hope for with their kids is that they find something that totally brings them happiness. Because, you know, I know you love what you do and I know what I love what I do and I wish for anyone watching or, or, or with their worlds and their kids is that their kids find something they love because that would ultimately be the best gift because, you know, I don't think we want jobs. And, well, <laughs> and, and in fairness, a lot of people, you know, want good jobs. And, you know, if you work hard and try to be the best at what you are, you can promote up within a company. Oh, absolutely. And, and so, you know, not everybody's going to be an entrepreneur, but everybody should do something they enjoy doing that they're good at doing so they can excel because you're not always in the right seat of the bus. And if you're doing something that doesn't make you happy, you're probably not going to do it well. So you need to find, you know, what that is. And not everybody's cut out to be a business owner. It's, it's hard. And, and some people, there's, as you know, the phone rings and there's problems and things that happen and everything that you do good is you and everything that you do bad is you. And, and when you're, when you're part of a team, you, you know, it, there's a little bit of deflection and, and some people don't want all the responsibility it takes to be an owner. And, you know, it, as long as people will work hard, I mean, that's advice I give to young people all the time, work your ass off. If you work hard, you'll be successful at whatever you're doing. If you like it and you work hard and continue to grow in an organization, you're always looking for those people who are just chomping at the bit to get ahead and you know prove themselves. And they can work their way up from whatever position your company to, they could be the president of the company one day and take over your position. Ultimately, your and my success is completely tied to the team you build around you. That's people. And, and not everyone can be the owner. 
Uh, but or wants to be. Or, the risk, and there are days that you don't want to be the owner, for sure, but at, at the end of the day, that team you build around you is a reflection of yourself, and it is also, um, you know, if they if they carry your philosophy and your passion, then ultimately they'll be they'll help you accelerate and be winners. Everybody can be part of the winning team, and uh, you know, not everybody uh, feels that way or they has as passionate about what you do or well, I do. And it's important to make people feel like part of a team because everybody wants the team to succeed. And the difference in being an owner is, you know, these things ring all the time. It doesn't stop for a seven o'clock or a nine o'clock in the evening or for a weekend or a Sunday. It's it, when you're an owner, you're constantly engaged. And you know, some people want to do that and some don't. There's many times where I go, gosh, it worked never. I heard a doctor and I was a kid. I was 18 years old and I had one of my first warehouses I ever rented and I had my stucco drywall business. And, and I heard a doctor talking in the parking lot to uh, another gentleman and he said, work never ends. And I really didn't know what he meant at the time. And now I know what he meant is work never ends. There is always an email. There's always a phone call you know, doing things around the world now. There's always an issue in London or another state or Nevada or wherever it happens to be because they're on different time clocks. So your attention always has to be on your business. And it's hard for guys like me and you. It's it's to our, it's good for us because we never shut it off and it's bad for us because we never shut it off. So, so the type A personalities that we both have, um, it, it can be this uh, thrill, but it's also, it, you seem to be on 24 seven and uh, the expectation is you have to make those tough decisions. By the way, I, I, I kind of thought about what your answer to your question you asked me earlier. What was one of the coolest shows you've ever done? I'll tell you, we were doing a show with an American who was in the um, Mir Stage Station. And uh, he was up there and he used to write his family and he was explaining about his life. He lived sleeping upside down with a fan because there's no, and, and he, when he went to the bathroom, he would go in a machine and he'd filter the water and he'd drink it. And that's how he lived in Mir. And I was in an audience of about, I don't know, 3,000 interns for one of the financial like accounting firms. And they were, he was explaining that they had to, um, one day they had a fire on this space station. And this fire, you know, he thought he would never see his family and, you know, what they did and they went to the escape capsule and, you know, he's taking you through the experience so you feel like that could have been you, right? Yeah. And, and uh, a very like an Elon Musk kind of moment, right? This crazy experience. And he explains that over Australia, they, they have to hit just a certain amount of propulsion to land at Kennedy Space Center or to land at one of the landing sites. And... And anyone who can create an experience where the audience is so engaged because they tell their story, those are the kind of things that just, they, they jazz yeah, that's, you. Yeah, that sounds like a cool story to hear. If you were there, I think they were just trying to scare the interns. And, <laughs> and, and to give you a little plug, um, yeah, I've, I've told our listeners that you know, I wrote the book Perseverance, mm -hmm. which once again can be found at chuckwedall.com. But Les has written two books. Two books. And uh, say the title of both of them where they can the find them. The first book is Don't Take No for an Answer. And it's about starting a business and finding the persistence and overcoming the obstacles that they are coming. And, and you kind of think about walking through landmines. And that's how you ultimately become successful, if you can make it through the landmines. And you hit a couple, but you still got to keep going. That's right. And the other book is about having the best life, and it's called uh, When All the Stars Align. And, uh, you know, I think uh, it's interesting. Uh, writing is a good way to share your story and hopefully inspire others. Well, that's what I found out when I wrote my book that um, unfortunately it's not out yet, it comes out December 1st, but I learned more about myself than I realized. I just, it was a walk through my life and, and you forget about all the things and everything you do. That's why it's neat to put it in writing because people all the time, you know, see successful people and say, how'd you get there? And you, when you write it, you realize what a journey that was to get to where you're at today. And we still have a long journey in front of us. Do, do you know any successful person, whether they've written a book or not, that hasn't worked really hard. I don't even know one who's won the lottery. So, uh, no, no, no. So, so no, saying, everybody every, works everyone hard. has worked really hard that you know and I know. And the small circle of people that we know, some of them we know together, uh, it's, you know, success is a derivative of hard work, sweat, equity, and a little bit of luck. And it's climbing the ladder, but in all fairness, and I, and I speak about this in my book, 
success is defined differently for everybody. Like, you know, what may be successful to, to you know, a woman may be raising her child perfectly. She's successful. It's not about mm -hmm. money. Or an artist, not about having a thousand people or a hundred thousand people. It's about singing a song and doing it right. Or an artist painting something that comes out beautiful. But to everybody's success is hard work. It's doing the best. It's hard work to raise a kid. It's hard work to paint a perfect painting. It's hard work to sing a song. It's about doing it right. It, it's things that are important to you, that you're passionate about, that connect to whatever measure of success you have. Well, you're a successful guy. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me. And uh, that's how we say goodbye now. So <laughs> I will see you guys next time. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.